for tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Sunday afternoon, August the 17th, 1969. Christ for the Nation Seminar, Dallas, Texas. This tape was with Dr. Derek Prince speaking on the inheritance of the saints in light. This is service 9 of 9. This tape is my vision of the regathering of God's people. Dr. Derek Prince, the Lord bless you good. I would like to begin, as others have done, by saying thank you to everybody here and to my fellow ministers in the seminar, Brother Duncan and Brother Myers. I've known Brother Myers quite a while, and it's been a real privilege to be associated both with him and with Brother Duncan. We've never been associated together before. I enjoyed the spectacle of two stiff traditional Britishers getting the Americans loosened up the other night. I thought that was rather good. And I also appreciated the, the time when Brother Rannigan was here and a Catholic was urging the Pentecostals to be really free in worship. That did me good, too. So you never know what's going to happen these days. And then I've met so many old friends and made many new friends. And thank you for your fellowship and your love. And please remember us in our ministry and your prayers in the days that lie ahead as the Holy Spirit prompts you to pray for us. Will you do that? My wife and I have the sincere desire to do the will of God and to fulfill the ministry to which God has called us. Brother Lindsay's mentioned my books. There are the seven books of the Foundation Series and there's the new self-study Bible course. The special offer on these closes at the end of this afternoon's service. Now, I said to you this afternoon that I would speak on my vision of the regathering of God's people, and that is what I intend to do. I would like to commence with Psalm tw uh, Proverbs 29, 18, which says, in part, where there is no vision, the people perish. The word vision, which is used quite frequently through the Old Testament, means direct, up-to-date, communication from God. It does not necessarily mean what we would call a vision in the sense of seeing something before your eyes. It has a broader sense of fresh, direct revelation from God. It does not in any sense set aside the Word of God, and in many cases, in fact, basically the most profound vision is not a new vision, but it's a revelation of the vision given in the Word of God. But what God's people have to have is continually fresh revelation from God. We cannot live on yesterday's bread. In the tabernacle every day, fresh bread had to be exposed before the Lord. And when God fed his people with manna in the wilderness during the same period, they were never allowed to leave today's manna till tomorrow. In fact, if they did so, it bred worms and stank. And God never wants you to be living on yesterday's manna. We've got to have a fresh daily portion. In the offerings ordained at the same period with God's people, under the Levitical law of Moses, uh, there were various different types of things that people could bring. Amongst them was what the King James Version calls wafers, which were things that had been prepared in advance and could be stored. But the law stated that every time you brought a wafer, you had to anoint it with fresh oil. So you can never live on yesterday's experience, yesterday's message, yesterday's revelation. God's people have to have continual, fresh, up-to-date, direct revelation from God. And the scripture says, where there is no such vision, the people perish. Alternatively, it's translated, the people cast off restraint, or the people are made naked, or the people are frustrated. It's a word that's capable of many different translations. But one thing is sure, where there is no vision, God's purpose for his people cannot be fulfilled. God's people are frustrated. You can have the most correct doctrine, 
the most correct preaching. You can have everything beautifully, beautifully organized and every program beautifully carried out. But where there is no vision, where God is not speaking directly to his people by the Holy Spirit, then God's people are frustrated, they're made naked, they perish. And I'm afraid that really this is the condition, this is the problem in many sections of the Christian church. People are not living with an up-to-date vision. They don't have a clear, direct, personal revelation. They don't have that sense of an objective. People without an objective are aimless. They're purposeless. You remember the Apostle Paul. God gave him a vision. This was an actual vision of the eyes. And this gave his whole life meaning and purpose. And many years later, when he was on trial, he could say, Wherefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. And later on he said, I pressed toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. His life was not an aimless life. He knew why he was living. He knew where he was going. He knew what he was seeking to do. If you study the conversion of Paul, you'll find that when the Lord Jesus revealed himself to Paul, Paul asked Jesus two questions. And I've always felt that these questions were the basis of the tremendous success of Paul's subsequent ministry as a Christian. The first question was, Who art thou, Lord? The second was, What wilt thou have me to do? And if every conversion would begin that way, every Christian life would be fruitful. First of all, find out who Jesus is. Get to know that he's Lord. Lord of lords. King of kings. Lord of history. Lord of circumstance. Lord of the church. Lord of time, Lord of eternity, Jesus Christ is Lord. Secondly, what will thou have me to do? God, you have a purpose for my life. I'm not just a number. I'm not just a figure in some scheme. You know me personally. You know my name. You know where I live. You know my problems. You know my weaknesses. And you have a purpose for my life. I love that encounter between Jesus and the little tax collector Zacchaeus. You remember the story? It's so familiar. Zacchaeus was a short man, and there was a great crowd around the Lord, and he was afraid that he would not be able to see the Lord. So he ran ahead and climbed up into the branches of a sycamore tree just above the path where Jesus was to walk and waited there, hoping that from that elevation he would catch just a glimpse of the Lord as he passed by. And you remember when the Lord came there, something very unexpected to Zacchaeus happened. The Lord stopped, and he looked up, and you know the first thing he said? Zacchaeus. He even knew his name. He didn't have to be introduced. And if you are in the least bit interested in getting to know Jesus, my message to you this afternoon is Jesus already knows you. And he's interested. You may be up in the sycamore tree. You may be in an unconventional position seeking God. But if you'll just let the Lord speak to you, you'll find he knows your name. He knows your address. He knows your problems. He understands your background. He loves you, and he's got a purpose for your life. There is nothing more tragic than the purposeless, aimless life. One of the great tragedies of modern America, without a doubt, is privileged, wealthy young people with everything they need at home, sufficient education, but no purpose in life. They are so tragic, they're much more tragic than the young people that are brought up in a home with financial deprivation but a task to carry out. I thank God that when he saved me, and he saved me in an army barrack room in the British Army in the year 1941, in the Second World War, immediately, without any process of reasoning, I knew that I belonged to God and that he had a purpose for my life. Immediately. And so this afternoon I'm going to take a little while by way of introduction to what I have to say to recount to you certain definite personal experiences that I've had with the Lord. And then I will lead on from there to a brief presentation of what I believe is happening in the world and in the church today, what God is seeking to accomplish with the thought that this will enable you to find your part and your place in God's program. I was saved in July 1941 in the middle of the night in an army barrack room. 
I had a tremendous experience of salvation. I've never desired to go back to sin or the world at any time. I've never felt the world had anything more to offer me from that night forward. My whole aims and ambitions and attitudes and relationships were immediately and radically and permanently changed. And I had no doctrinal knowledge of what conversion was. I couldn't have told you the gospel in a nutshell if I'd tried. I met the Lord, and there is no conversion if you don't meet the Lord. And you cannot meet the Lord and stay the same. About two weeks later, in the same army barrack room, about 9.30 in the evening when the room was empty, the Lord baptized me in the Holy Spirit. I'd never seen anybody receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I'd heard very little about it. And I first began to speak in an unknown tongue lying on that straw mattress in the corner of the barrack room. About 15 minutes later, the soldier that shared the room with me returned from a dance, opened the door, and I began to speak to him, trying to tell him what had happened, and found I could no longer speak English. So I gave him my explanation in the new language. <laughs> that was how I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Nobody preached me into it. Nobody prayed me into it. I received it direct from God. And I had to look in the Bible to find out what had happened to me. And it was to me a, a revelation that all these things that had happened to me were right there in the New Testament, in the Bible. And one of my first reactions was this. Why did I waste all those years going to church when no one ever told me in church that these things are in the Bible and they can happen today? People sometimes say to me, Brother Prince, did you see tongues of fire? Did they come? And I say, no, not at that time. And only once in the book of Acts do we have the record of tongues of fire being manifested. On other occasions when people were baptized in the Holy Spirit, there was no such manifestation recorded as the tongues of fire or the rushing mighty wind. This is not an essential part of the baptism. The only essential part of the baptism is what happens to your tongue. This is the one vital, unchanging factor in this experience that you speak with a new tongue as the Spirit of God gives you utterance. However, after this, this experience happened to me in a town on the east coast of England in the county of Yorkshire, a beautiful little seaside town called Scarborough. I had a tremendous drawing towards the sea, and I would go during my spare time in the army and sit on a bench looking out across the sea. And as I saw the ebb and flow of the waves on the sea and considered the tremendous natural forces that were at work within the ocean, something in me bore witness that there was a power in me equal to the power outside there in the ocean. And I often thought of David's words, all thy waves and thy billows have gone over me. And on about three or more occasions, as I sat there, thus meditating on what God had done in my life, I had what could be called a vision. It happened this way, that the sea would disappear from my eyes, and I would see a kind of gray veil or curtain drawn across. And on this veil would appear many little tongues of fire. And as I watched them, they were all charged with tremendous activity. The first impression I got was of an irresistible energy at work. And they were running very, very swiftly. And on every occasion that I saw this, and I do not recall if it was three times or more, the climax of what I saw was that all these tongues of fire converged into the center of my field of vision and became one great big tongue of fire that absolutely dominated my whole field of vision. Now, I never forgot that vision, but for many years I did not fully understand what the Lord was showing me. But when, without planning it, I came to the United States in 1962 and then immigrated in 1963 from Canada, and I was introduced to the, what we call the charismatic movement or the charismatic renewal. And I began to see and hear firsthand what was happening in all these denominations all over this continent. 
And particularly, I began to understand the tremendous, the uncountable number of little groups that were beginning to meet in people's homes, little unofficial groups, prayer groups, Bible study groups, often spanning several denominations, and usually under the leadership of lay people, I realized that this was what God had shown me in that vision, that at his appointed hour, all over the world, in every section of the church, these little tongues of fire were going to suddenly spring up, and Christians who'd been dormant and passive and inactive and without a vision and a purpose were going to be charged with heavenly energy and purpose, and that all these little tongues of fire were going to begin to move, and that the climax would be they'd all come together into one great single tongue of fire which would absolutely dominate the field of human vision and the stage of human history. And I have not the faintest doubt in my mind today that we are witnessing this thing happen before our eyes. And I have not a shadow of doubt that the climax will be as I've described it to you. Then after that, I was sent overseas and became, I was four and a half years overseas in continuous overseas military service, three years in North Africa and the last 18 months in Palestine. Spent the last year of my military service on the spot from which that photograph or painting was taken, the Mount of Olives. That was my last military location in the British Army. One year I lived on the Mount of Olives. Then I obtained my release from the British forces, contrary to all custom, in Palestine. And the day I stepped out of the army, I became a missionary to the Jewish people. I never went back to Britain at that time. I went before no board, no committee, no church. I had no underwriting or promise of support from any particular group. And I was unknown to the churches at large because I'd been a total unbeliever when I went into the forces five and a half years previously. But I knew that God had called me. And at that time, I thank God for the faithful, spirit-filled wife that he gave me. And we agreed together to trust the Lord for all our needs. And we've been doing it ever since, and the Lord has never failed us yet. He is absolutely faithful. If you know for sure he's called you to do something, get sure about that, then you could absolutely absolutely trust him to stand by you and provide for you in everything that he asks you to do. We were through the first stages of the independence of the state of Israel, and then for reasons which are too elaborate to explain, we left Jerusalem and came to Britain, and we brought with us eight girls, six Jewish girls, one Arab girl, and one English girl that we were parents to. And I came back to Britain, my own country, as a refugee which is a very unpleasant experience. And I saw a side of things that I'd never seen in my previous life in Britain. But it was good for me, I don't doubt, and it was certainly educational. And I have to say this, I didn't intend to, but the people that were kindest to us were really my parents. My father was a colonel in the British Army, and he was not used to full gospel people, missionaries, and the Jews he viewed with the usual suspicion of most Gentiles, to say the truth, in America or Britain. So everything about us was contrary to what he would have wished. But he and my mother really showed us more hospitality and more love than all the full gospel people put together. Just have to say it. I've learned to find love where I find it. Sweet words and nice sounding testimonies don't always convince me that there's real love there. Well, then I became the pastor of a rather strange congregation in London, which I pastored for eight years, London, England. This work was begun by two of our Jewish girls. I didn't intend to say this, but one girl of 16 and one girl of 14 would go out where, from where we lived to a place in London that Brother Duncombe mentioned. Is Brother Duncombe here this afternoon? He went and he had to go. Well, and I'm not holding that against him, but... Um, I just wanted him to know that he got it wrong. He said it was uh, Hyde Park Corner, but he's mistaken. He's been too long away. It was Marble Arch. It's a place called Speaker's Corner, where anybody can go and preach about anything. The only thing you're not allowed to attack is the royal family. Anything else. You can attack the government, the church, it doesn't matter what you say. You're not allowed to attack the royal family. And uh, this girl of 16, this Jewish girl, her name was Ruhama, 
and a little Jewish girl of 14 whose name was Magdalene would go out. We allowed them to go out and stay out till a certain hour. They'd come back, and they were usually in a rush to get back, and they just got in in time. And we didn't know where they were going. And then one day, my wife and I took a walk through the park there, because we lived close at hand, and we came to Speaker's Corner, Marble Arch, and there was about four groups of people, as there usually were. And before television really took on, and when Britain was still under a financial burden from the war, a Many more people would go out there in the evening because they had nowhere else to go. And we saw a large group of people, and in the middle, a, a young-looking lady with long black hair. And these British fellow countrymen of mine were really molesting this girl. They were pulling her hair and abusing her. And I said to my wife, what's going on? And then I said, you know, that looks like Rohama. And we walked a bit closer, and it was Rohama. She was right in the middle of about 200 people, and they were really giving her a bad time. She had gone out there and started to preach to them. And while she preached, the 14-year-old girl went around handing out tracts to people. And so I got so indignant with my British fellow countrymen, I stepped in that ring and I said, you should be ashamed of yourselves to treat a girl of 16 like this. And when I said that, I started to preach. And I'd said to my wife before, there's one thing I'll never do, you'll never catch me preaching at Speaker's Corner, Marble Arch. <laughs> well, some of you would find it hard to believe, but for the next eight years, I preached there three times every week. And we saw many souls saying, many people come to the Lord. It wasn't an easy place, but I'll tell you, when you've preached the Speaker's Corner, you are not afraid of interruptions or hecklers any longer. <laughs> And out of those two little Jewish girls and their activity, our congregation started. We never planned it. We didn't intend it. But many people came to the Lord through their testimony. And so we began a work that God planned and not we. And I was there with that work for eight years. And one night in 1953, I had preached. It was a Sunday night. I hadn't preached about any special theme that I can recall. And for me at that time, the United States of America was a very distant place. We cannot easily recall how much jet travel has changed the world, even in ten years. And I, I did not have any special burden or theme on my mind when I went to bed. At about 2 a.m. on Monday morning, I found myself absolutely wide awake, lying in bed. And I had an experience which has never been repeated up till now that I heard God speaking to me from within my own body. The voice of God was speaking, but it was not prophecy. It did not come out through my lips. It did not use my voice. And I want to tell you a part of what God said to me. I will not tell you all because part of it was very personal about myself, but I'll give you just the beginning and the ending. And it came without any introduction, any preamble, or any such thing. This was what God said, and I have never for one moment in all my life doubted that God spoke to me and said that thing. He said, there shall be a great revival in the United States and Great Britain. And then he spoke to me about my own ministry, and he concluded with these words, but the condition is obedience in small things and in great things, for the small things are as great as the great things. Now, I check in the Bible on that, because I always check everything by Scripture. And I saw that in most places where the Bible speaks about the small and the great, it almost always puts the small before the great. A lot of people would be faithful in the great, but they can't be bothered to be faithful in the small, and believe me, they never get the opportunity to be faithful in the great. Because Jesus said, if you're faithful in that which is least, then you'll be faithful also in that which is much. And I have seen this as a principle of God's dealings. If you're faithful in the little thing, you'll be promoted to a bigger thing. But if you wait for promotion to be faithful, as far as God is concerned, you wait indefinitely. So I knew that God had planned a great revival. He did not say a revival. He said a great revival. And I'd often wondered how God referred to the nations of the modern world. And he said, definitely, the United States and Great Britain. Now, at that time, it would be hard to imagine a drier spiritual period 
in British history. I know it was 1953 because it was the year before Billy Graham first came to London and held one of his great crusades, which was 1954. Nevertheless, I have never doubted that God spoke to me that night. And now I believe in his infinite wisdom and faithfulness he has brought me to the United States to see it happen. And of all the places I ever planned to go to, the United States was not on the list. Simply because I reckon that if there was any country in the world that had enough preachers already, it must be America. <laughs> However, the Lord brought me here. And I believe I am here in God's purpose to witness a great revival which shall sweep this entire nation. And from here it will move to Britain. But God showed me very clearly it would be first in the United States and then in Great Britain. I have no doubt in my mind. I do not pray for it. I thank God that it's coming. And I do it almost every day of my life. After that, I went on the mission field again in East Africa and spent five years as a missionary in East Africa in educational work. Returned to Europe at the end of 1961. And in 1962, at the beginning of the year, I was in my wife's native country, which is Denmark. And I was a few days without a preaching engagement staying with my wife's sister in the northwest corner of Denmark in that area which the English-speaking people call Jutland and the Danes call by a name that doesn't even sound like that. And there, there was a certain cliff that I had come to love that was lonely and deserted and I could walk out on this cliff and pray out loud and shout and do anything I like and scare nobody but the seagulls. And I was out there on this cliff one day praying, and the Lord began to speak to me. He did not speak this time with an audible voice, but it was just as clear. He spoke to my mind, but it was absolutely clear. And he spoke to me like this. He said, now you have done this and that. And he enumerated the things I've done. You've been a missionary in two countries. You, you've uh, preached here and preached there. You're the principal of a college. You're the member of a denomination. You are accepted. You have a pension scheme. And he was very careful to point that out. And when he'd said all this, he came out with a question. Are you satisfied or do you want to go further? And I say, may the Lord forgive me, I was a little offended to think that there was anything further. Now, you might think that was conceit, but it was not deliberate conceit. Now, all the things that are so new to many of you here, and thank God they are, were familiar to me for many years at that time. Salvation, the bats and the Holy Spirit, speaking with tongues, the gifts of the Spirit, divine healing, the truth of the Lord's return. I'd known and preached these things for many years and seen results. I thought, what could there be further? And I was in some sense slightly frightened. And I've learned not to be rash in what I say to God because the fifth chapter of Ecclesiastes says don't vow a vow to the Lord and say afterwards it was a mistake because it's recorded in a book by an angel and you're going to be confronted with that vow. If you don't know that's there, remember and look it up. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. So I said, in effect, Lord, give me time to think this over. And I went away and I spent about two days thinking over and then I went back to the cliff and I got in touch with God again and I said, now Lord, I'm ready with my answer. And my answer was this, no, Lord, I'm not satisfied. If there is anything further, I want to go further. And when I said I'm not satisfied, for the first time I realized how dissatisfied I really was. Like multitudes of ministers, and there are many in the church today, I was trying to pretend that I was satisfied with what was going on. There couldn't be more, and this is the way it's done, and this is the way it's always been done, and you know everybody does it like this, and this is what everybody preaches, and this is accepted Pentecostal doctrine. But when I said, in honesty to God, I'm not satisfied, then for the first time I realized what a deep desire and longing there was within me for more. And I said, Lord, I'm not satisfied. If there is anything further, I want to go further. And the Lord gave me a very clear, specific answer. Now, I have to say that this answer was for me. I'm not saying it's for you. I say this in view of the second thing that the Lord told me, because otherwise you might become slightly offended with me. The Lord said this, Well, there are two conditions. The first is 
that all progress in the Christian life is by faith. And if you are not willing to go forward in faith, you cannot go forward. Secondly, if you are to fulfill the ministry which I have for you, you will need a strong, healthy body. And you are putting on too much weight. You better look to that. And I thank God for this. He is so practical. And I've attended to that problem, and I keep my eye very definitely upon it. I weigh myself about once a week, and when I begin to go up, I take action. And I know since then how true what the Lord said was. I had no idea of the nature of the ministry that lay ahead. But believe me, if I didn't keep myself healthy, there are things I could not go through. So this opened a new phase of my ministry. I didn't realize the extent of the commitment that I'd made. That was at the beginning of 1962. I then went to Canada where I was committed to go, spent one year in Canada itinerating, and at the beginning of 1963, without any premeditation or planning, my wife and I entered the United States from the province of Winnipeg into the state of Minnesota, and for six months I was associate pastor of an Assembly of God church in Minneapolis, pastoring with a friend of mine whom I'd met out in the Middle East in the Second World War. We did not come to stay in the United States. We came as visitors with a visitor's visa. When the immigration official at the border asked me how long we intended to stay, I replied, about six months. And he said, well, that's too long for a visit. And I looked at him and I said, well, maybe you could arrange it for us. And that's just what they did. They were most courteous and most helpful. They said, come in, we'll put you on parole, and you can take it up with the immigration department. Now, we had with us a little African girl of three and a half years old at that time for whom we had no birth certificate and no official passport document. And I'm convinced that had we tried from outside to immigrate with her, we would never have been admitted. But we came in, not planning immigration, got in, and praise God, up to now they've never turned us out. So that's how it happened, entirely unplanned. You see, the most important things in life often happen when you're not even planning them. You know that? You sweat and you pray and you fast over some decision and you make it and it turns out to be unimportant. And another moment you do or say something you've never premeditated and it decides and changes the course of your entire life. And that's how it's been many times with me. So here I am in the United States to witness what God promised me would take place. Isn't he faithful? Now, in the year 1964, this is the last of these personal revelations, and it's only leading up to something further that I want to speak about. In the year 1964, I was pastoring an independent Pentecostal church in the city of Seattle, Washington, and I was receiving many speaking engagements, mainly with the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship. And I felt I couldn't do both. I was not being fair to the church that was paying me a salary because I was going away so often. So I came to a crisis. And I decided at that point that I would resign my pastorship and just let the Lord lead me. I didn't have many preaching engagements, and I was a stranger in the country, and a wife, and this little African girl. But I have never regretted that step. God has been more than faithful. If there should be anybody here this afternoon that is under some denomination, and you are wondering what might happen if the Lord should call you out, and ask you to go it alone. This is no criticism of denominations, but I just want to tell you that the Lord can take care of you just as well and somewhat better than any denomination can do it. Don't be scared. That autumn or fall, I was back again in Denmark, 1964, back again staying with my wife's sister, and one beautiful fine fall afternoon, I was out on the top of this cliff, where the Lord had challenged me about two years and a half previously. And I was just looking out across the waves of the sea, which were about a hundred feet below me, and the Lord started to speak to me again, to my mind. And he gave me a brief outline of church history. And he showed me that the history of the church is like the behavior of the time, that the early church was high time, 
But after the early church, the tide began to go out, and it went out steadily until the Middle Ages when it was low tide. And in the Middle Ages, it turned around, and it started to come back again with the times associated with the Lutheran Reformation and so on, and that it had been coming back ever since. The Lord showed me also that the tide does not go out in one steady flow like a stream, nor does it come back in one steady flow. But it's always a succession of waves, but when the tide is going out, each successive wave does not reach quite, reach quite so high as the previous wave. And so gradually the waves lose a whole area of the beach which they once controlled. And God showed me that this was how it had been in the early church. At one time they had controlled and covered the inheritance of God. And though the Holy Spirit had continued to move in waves in the church, the waves had not been so powerful, and gradually the church had lost a great area that it once covered. And then that the restoration was likewise by waves, and that now the difference was that each wave came a little higher than the previous wave. But the Lord showed me that when a wave came, it held its position for a few moments and then began to retreat and that the same wave never would come back again. And he showed me, in my mind, uh, certain great waves that had passed through the church from Luther and the Wesleys and Finney and the Welsh Revival and so on. And then the Lord brought me up to the Pentecostal movement of which I was an ordained minister and an integral part. And he showed me that the Pentecostal movement, which began at the beginning of this century, around about the year 1904, 1906 and so on, had been one of the great waves, that it had recovered areas that had not been recovered by any previous wave, such as the speaking with tongues, the truth of divine healing for the physical body, and the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Lord showed me this, and now I hope you'll keep loving me after this. He showed me that the Pentecostal movement had reached its climax, checked, and was withdrawing. Now, this was as clear as if it was written on the wall in front of me now. And I thought, Lord, well, what about it? Because I don't know what you, you've got at stake, but I had given up literally everything. I'm not exaggerating. My home, my country, my family, my profession, my money, my reputation, literally everything to be in that Pentecostal mood. And I thought, Lord, is it, is it going back? Is it receding? And then the Lord showed me there's a new wave coming. And he showed me it's going to be a greater wave than any previous wave that has ever come. Praise God. But, listen friends, it's not going to be the Pentecostal movement. It's not going to be a new Pentecostal movement. It's not going to be the Methodist church. It's not going to be the Baptist church. It's not going to be the Catholic church. God never revives a revival. Once the wave has come, checked, receded, doesn't come back again. And I said, Lord, what about me? In so many words. And then the Lord gave me a message of encouragement. He said, the same wave will never come back. But he said, some of the water that was in the previous wave can come back in the next one. And I said, Lord, that's my decision. Right now, I'm coming back in the next one. And I believe it. And, uh, friend, I hope I haven't offended you, but I've told you what I believe to be the truth. And you do well to get adjusted to it. The move that's coming now is not going to promote the Baptists. It's not going to promote the Catholics. It's not going to promote the Methodists. It's not going to promote the Assemblies of God. In many cases, it will be unsatisfactory to all those groups. Anybody who wants their own little kingdom extended and their own little denomination promoted and their own little flag planted is going to be disappointed. Because God is not interested in any of that. He's interested in restoring the bride of Jesus Christ, the church, in making her ready for the coming of the Lord and in equipping and sending forth the laborers that will reap the final harvest. And the only person that's going to be glorified in all this is the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church. Amen. Let's praise him. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Now, I believe it's important to know that. Uh, I, I, I stated part of this when I was here, I believe, last year. You remember that? Brother Kenneth Hagen was here, and he got so excited he couldn't sit still in his seat. He just kept himself till the end of the message. He said, what year did the Lord show you that? I said, 1964. 
And he said, the Lord showed me exactly the same thing, exactly the same year. So here we are, there's a new wave coming. And don't get sucked in in the undertow from the previous wave. I want to warn you of that. I, I want to tell you this. Let's be clear on our ethical practices, our moral practices, our methods of promotion. When you get into this exciting full gospel realm, it's very exciting. And you begin to feel, well, we can do anything. We can storm the world. And I warn you, and I know Brother Lindsay would endorse what I say from experience, be careful that you don't get so excited that you lose your vision of moral and ethical values. Because there are a lot of excited people that are not practicing morality the way it should be practiced, or ethics the way they should be practiced. And this is what I consider to be the undertow. And it's a very dangerous thing to be caught in an undertow. Be careful. Keep yourself clear. Don't get associated with anything that isn't ethically right. Don't accept any kind of doctrine that begins to encourage moral looseness. You know, behind almost every fancy false doctrine, you'll find a second woman somewhere. You can try, but it's true. Well, now we're permitted to have soulmates. And there you are, and that movement is just lost. It's written off by God. God is a God of morality. He's a God of ethics. He's a God of purity. He's a God of honesty. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. We don't have to exaggerate the numbers in our, in our, in our campaigns and crusades. We don't have to blow everything up to get God's blessing. In fact, that is the way we forfeit the blessing of God. And many men that could have been in what God is going to do now have forfeited the privilege by unethical practices. It pays off for a little while. But it doesn't endure. And I'm convinced that God is searching and sifting the church in a very serious way to eliminate wrong motives before he really comes in with this new move. And I've seen people, I thought, well, he must be one of the people that God is going to use. And then I've seen them just put aside. And the reason is, they wouldn't have given God the glory. Or they would have allowed unethical or immoral considerations to enter in. And I, I just want to warn you. I know Brother Lindsay's been on this road longer than I have, but I've been long enough to see the wrecks by the way. I'll tell you something else. Don't get excited by your testimony. You can go around and give your testimony and thrill people for about two years if you were a ballet dancer or a prize fighter or a drug addict. But after that time, your testimony will wear thin, and if that's all you've got, you're going to sink. You've got to get into the Word of God. Amen. And any group or any movement that bypasses the serious teaching of the Word of God is going to be left by the way. This is absolutely certain. Now, let's just take the history, the, the Scriptures picture of this close of the age, and I'm going to read you some Scriptures and seek to present it to you in the context of Scripture. All I've said so far is just by way of, I can't say introduction because it was much too long, but uh, and now I'm moving out of the realm of personal into the realm of scriptural, which is much more important. Out in Acts 3.21 by the Apostle Peter, there is no doubt the key word for our generation is restoration. The church had a reformation. It cannot have another reformation. It must have a restoration and the restoration will be the restoration of the true church of Jesus Christ. That's all that God is interested in. But beside the restoration of the church, there is another restoration, which is the restoration of Israel. And this, if you do not know it, is one of the most fascinating revelations of Scripture and prophecy. There is a double parallel restoration going on precisely side by side. The restoration of national Israel to their own land and the restoration of the church to its inheritance in Christ, the inheritance that we spoke about in the week, the inheritance of the saints in light. This is portrayed very clearly in the book of the prophet Joel, where you'll find that the theme of Joel simplified is, first of all, desolation, then restoration through the outpoured spirit, and then judgment on those that refuse the restoration. And at the beginning of the book of Joel, the scene is one of total desolation, and in the forefront of the desolation are two typical trees, the fig tree and the vine. And I believe myself, I do not seek to convince you, 
that these are types of God's two people, the fig tree Israel and the vine the church. And both of them are totally desolated at the beginning of this vision. And then when the restoration begins to come, in the middle of the second chapter of Joel, you find that both the fig tree and the vine are right there in the forefront of restoration. You can find it in the 22nd verse of Joel tw chapter 2. There they are. So there is to be a desolation. Well, we've passed through the desolation, friends. Then there's to be a restoration. A restoration of Israel nationally. A restoration of the church spiritually. Let me point out to you that every major prophecy relating to the end of this age assumes the presence of Israel as a nation in their own land. Until Israel were put back in their own land by a sovereign act of God, none of those prophecies could be fulfilled. The end of the age could not come. Now, almost every one of those prophecies is ripe for fulfillment. This is the most vital fact in fulfilled prophecy that exists today. Secondly, I cannot take time to go into this in detail, but as I was pondering on the deliverance services that the Lord has led me to hold, and this is one of the things that the Lord led me into when I made this commitment. If I'd never made this commitment in 1962, I would never have received this further instruction from the Lord on the ministry of deliverance, which was not of my choosing. You can believe me that. If the Lord had asked, what ministry do you want that would not have appeared on the list? But the Lord has made it real to me, so real I cannot doubt. But what shocked me was the number of full gospel Christians that need deliverance. In some churches, it's up to 75% of the congregation. Now, I've not tried this just once or twice, but in different places. When I preach the message of deliverance under the anointing of the Holy Spirit in the will of God, I have known as many as three out of four in a congregation of four or five hundred people indicate that they felt they needed some kind of deliverance from Satan's infiltration. And this distressed me for a time. I thought, God, can this be the true condition of the church? But you know, I discovered something else. When I preach on the need to forgive other people, that this is a basic condition of Christian living and Christian victory, and that we cannot be right with God and we cannot have the blessing of God if we have unforgiveness in our heart against other people, and when at the end of that message I ask a Christian congregation how many people realize they need to forgive somebody else, I never get less than 50% of the congregation respond. See? That's the condition of the church. And I was in meetings the other day where a Methodist minister who had been involved without his intention in spiritism and so on, preached and just gave people a little instruction in a, in a non-critical spirit about Gene Dixon and Edgar Casey. And when he asked how many people in that congregation, which was a representative interdenominational congregation, had been involved with them, one out of every three persons put up their hand. See, this is the condition of the church. One out of every three persons has been involved in some kind of divination, spiritism, or witchcraft. More than half the people need to forgive somebody else. And when you preach on deliverance, up to 75% feel they need to be delivered. Now, I believe, I honestly have to say this, I believe one of the ministries the Lord gave me was to take the lid off things and show people the way they really are. And it's our most unpopular ministry. But it doesn't change the way things are. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. I made a study of the men who were saved in the New Testament to have been filled with or full of the Holy Spirit. And I discovered certain outstanding features of those men. First of all, I'll mention that five out of eight of them died a martyr's death. <laughs> That's more than 50%. Secondly, I noticed that every one of them was a person of outstandingly plain speech. And I do not believe the Holy Spirit will ever fully honor anything that is not said plainly. If we flatter people, if we seek to hold back any measure of truth in order to refrain from injuring somebody's feelings or hurting some denominational pride, God cannot bless as he wishes to bless. We are obligated to tell the thing the way it is. You know what I like about the young generation in America? That's their slogan. Tell us the way it is. And I, that should be the greatest challenge to preachers, to go out and do it. No fancy stuff. No silly emotional gimmicks. Just go out and tell them the way it is. And my experience with young people is they respond. That's what they want. They're tired of religious games. And a lot of hypocrisy, which they see in their parents' homes, isn't lived out the rest of the week. And if they're full gospel people, they're tired of a religion which is a suit that hangs in the closet. 
put on to go to church and put back in the closet the moment they get home. You say, Brother Prince, you've left off preaching and you're meddling in other people's business. That's very true, but I happen to know the business of the people who, with whom I'm meddling. See? <laughs> and when I was concerned about this and brought it up before God and said, God, how could this be? Don't let me go astray. Don't let me get off track. The Lord spoke to me one day. And again, I'm giving a, a revelation. He spoke to my mind. I'm not saying, I just present it the way it is. He said, you've preached a great deal about Joel, he said, and the theme of Joel is desolation, restoration, so on. I said, yes. And he said, you've preached also that the fig tree typifies Israel and the vine typifies the church. And I said, yes. And he said, did you ever stop to consider what caused the desolation? And I said, no, but I've got it now. An invading army of insects. And the Lord said to me very clearly, my people have been systematically infiltrated by the forces of the enemy. It's not accidental, it's deliberate, it's planned, it's plotted. And then he added something else which I haven't bargained for. He said, you can see how far away the fig tree Israel have been from their God-given inheritance all these 18 centuries. And I said, yes. And the Lord, if I understand his voice, said this. In my sight, the church has been just as far away from its inheritance spiritually as Israel have from their inheritance politically. And today that makes sense. I believe it. No, I'm adjusted. I have no more problem. It fits in with Scripture. I see the thing the way it is. And one of the great activities of God at the moment is to purge the church, to get the fifth column out of the church, because the church cannot possibly function the way that God intends, or fulfill the task that God has committed to her until this fifth column has been eliminated. And as the Spirit of God is truly put out, this is taking place. And when it has taken place, then we're going to be astonished at the church we'll see. Then the world will say, Who is this that looketh forth? Fair as the morning, clear as the sun, terrible as an army with banners. We've never seen a church like that before. Is this the same church that used to sit behind closed doors on Sunday morning, sing three hymns and have the announcements and say a prayer and go home? We don't recognize the people. There's a revolution taking place. There is. There's a revolution taking place. Now then, having said this, let me give you a few scriptures and close. There is a set time in God's program for Israel and for the church. A set time to regather Israel, a set time to regather the church. The regathering of Israel on the one hand and the regathering of the church on the other are proceeding side by side with ever increasing rapidity towards the climax of this age. Psalm 102, verses 12 through 16. But thou, O Lord, shalt endure forever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion. For the time to favor her, yea, the set time is come. For thy servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth thy glory. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. Zion is a picture, first of all, of the Jewish state, secondly, of the Christian church. It is used in both senses in the scripture. And the Bible says that though both have lain desolate for many centuries, God has a set time, a definite appointed moment to show favor, and it means unmerited grace upon Zion. Friends, you can see so clearly that the Jews don't deserve to get the land back. Can't you see that? How many people tell me that? God didn't give it to them back because they deserved it. He gave it back to them because he promised it. God's dealings with Israel are based on grace, not on their merits. But remember, my good friend, you didn't deserve to get saved, either. God dealt with you in grace as an individual. He deals with Israel in grace as a nation. It's God's grace in both ways. It's the time to show grace, favor on Zion. The church doesn't deserve the revival that the church is having. Don't be deceived. This is God's favor, grace on the church. It's a divine visitation. We're not better than the people that lived a generation before us. We're not better than the great preachers that have dotted the church history. We haven't got anything over them as individuals, but we're living in a time of divine visitation. And I pray for you to, this afternoon that it shall never be said to you by God, 
because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. That's a tragedy. Jesus wept over Jerusalem 19 centuries ago and dismissed them out of God's program because they knew not the time of their visitation. And if you don't recognize the time of God's visitation, you will not find your place in God's program. There is a set time for God to show favor on Zion. And then this glorious statement, verse 16, when the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. The greatest single evidence that the Lord is ready to appear is that he is building up Zion. This is the greatest single sign, building up Israel, building up the church. He's going to be coming very soon in his glory. Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, and a few words there. I'm going quickly now. I trust you'll be able to fit into the pattern the things that I'm now bringing forth. Verse 3 of Jeremiah 31. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Again I will build thee, and thou shalt be built, O virgin of Israel. Thou shalt again be adorned with thy tabrets, and shalt go forth in the dances of them that make merry. And this is being fulfilled today. It's happening in Israel. You can put a check against this and say, being fulfilled. Thou shalt yet plant vines upon the mountains of Samaria. This is being fulfilled. My wife can remember when there were no vines growing on the mountains of Samaria. Today, the mountains of Samaria are covered with vines. The planter shall eat them, and shall, eat them as, shall plant and eat them as common things. Verse 6, For there shall be a day that the watchman upon the Mount Ephraim shall, rise, shall cry, Arise ye, and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. David Ben-Gurion, the first premier of Israel, says that this was the motto of the Zionist movement. There came a moment when Jewish leaders, the watchmen, the, the people with the vision said, Now is the time to get back to Zion. It started in 1897, the first Zionist world conference held in Switzerland. Put a check against that verse and say, Being fulfilled, this is the time when the watchman has said, Arise, and let us go up unto Zion. For verse 7, For thus saith the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. What do you think the chief of the nations is? Surely you couldn't doubt that that's the United States of America. I mean, I'm not being sarcastic. And you see, this scripture is being fulfilled today, this afternoon in your ears. Shout and publish amongst the chief of the nations. Say what? Praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country, that's northern Europe and Russia, and gather them from the coasts of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and her that traveleth with child together. A great company shall return thither. They shall come with weeping, and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Now listen to verse 10, for this is for you people here this afternoon. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, that's the Gentiles, and declare it in the isles afar off, that's this continent, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. The same God that scattered Israel 19 centuries ago, today is gathering him. Don't be under any misunderstanding. God said he would do it. And he is doing it. And if you love your Bible, you should rejoice at this tremendous, up-to-date, objective confirmation that the Bible is an absolutely reliable book. It's true today. The prophet Jeremiah lived about 2,500 years ago. The words that he spoke then are being fulfilled before our eyes today. And the Bible actually states that we are to declare this in the isles of off amongst the nations and to the chief of the nations that he that scattered Israel is gathering him. And that is what I am doing here as God's mouthpiece this afternoon. You take your pencil and you put a check against that and say, Fulfilled. August the 16th, is it the 17th? 1969. That's how real the Bible is today. Jeremiah 50, verses 4 to 6. I'm just reading and moving on quickly. Jeremiah the 50th chapter, verses 4 through 6. In those days and in that time, said the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together, going and weeping. They shall go and seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion with their faces thitherward, saying, Come and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. 
Notice the covenant of the law was not a perpetual covenant. It was a temporary covenant. But the way back to Zion is through a perpetual covenant in which they will be joined to the Lord that will never be broken off. This is the new covenant in their Messiah, Jesus Christ. Verse 6. My people have been lost sheep. How beautifully that was brought out, wasn't it, in the film that we saw. And if you think that film is effective in America, my opinion is it will be twice as effective in Israel. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains, and they have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. That's true of Israel, but friend, it's no less true of the church. I have to say it. Their, ch their shepherds have failed them. They have not shepherded them. They have not told them the truth. They have not declared to them the message of the gospel. They've substituted man-made traditions and forms and ceremonies that cannot save, that cannot heal, that cannot deliver. And God's people today are scattered like sheep on every mountain and hill, wandering to and fro, looking for rest and not knowing where to find peace. Do you know that it's not uncommon for a person to sit in a professedly evangelical church ten years with a deep inner burden that no one in the church ever hears about? And at the end of that time, that person will go to a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist will say, your problem is you have a guilt complex. Isn't it astonishing that a person can sit with a guilt complex unresolved in a church that claims to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ for as long as ten years? What have the shepherds been doing? We have no option as to what we are to preach, friend. We are being given only one thing to preach. That's the word of God. The instant in season, out of season. Paul said to the Ephesian Christians, the leaders of the church, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And no minister will be able to state that he is clear from the blood of all those to whom he has ministered, if he has in any respect shunned or refrained from declaring the full counsel of God in Jesus Christ. We have no option about the message. It is not ours to fashion, it is ours to deliver. In the 34th chapter of Ezekiel, the same great truth is brought out again, and I believe these words occurred in the film that you saw. Ezekiel 34, verse 10, and a few verses following. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds. And this is a refrain of the three prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel continual statement that God is going to hold a day of reckoning with the shepherds of his people. And I believe that day is close at hand. And I will require my flock at their hand and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, even I, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. Now, this is being fulfilled in the world today. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. This is happening on the pages of history. It's happening to Israel. It's happening to the church. God's people have been scattered. They've wandered on mountain and hill. They have not known their resting place. But the Lord Jesus, in the cloudy and dark day, the troubled times, the day of trouble at the close of this age has arisen the good shepherd. And he said, when the other shepherds have failed, I will both search my sheep and seek them out and I will gather them from every place where they have been scattered and I will bring them again and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. John 10:16 says, there shall be one fold and one shepherd. John 17:21 says, Jesus prays that they, all that believe in him, may be one in us, the Father and the Son, that the world may believe. John 17, 23 says that they, the believers, may be made perfect in one, that the world may know. And I believe the prayer that Jesus prayed in the 17th chapter of John's Gospel is being answered by God the Father today. I do not believe that Jesus ever prayed a prayer that the Father will not answer. This is what is happening in the church. This is why this revival is different from all previous revivals. It will not be a denominational revival. There will be no denomination promoted and no denomination built as a result of this revival. This is where the Lord Jesus himself has stepped into history and is seeking and searching out his sheep and gathering them back 
and he's going to place them in one fold and there will be one shepherd. The scripture clearly states it and the evidence of our eyes and history show that it is taking place. This is the meaning of what is happening today in the world. It is God's final great sovereign intervention of grace and mercy and power on behalf of his people Israel and his people the church. This is the meaning of what we see taking place. Now as I close, I want you to try to picture this as it's become so vivid for me. Think about the Jewish people and imagine when they were scattered the first century of this era they all had one common language they all had common, co common customs, common clothing, common methods of doing things, a common system of money. They were one nation. And then in the fulfillment of God's prophecies, they were scattered to every corner of the earth and almost every nation of the earth. And now, 18 or 19 centuries later, God is calling them back, saying to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the coasts of the earth. And now I want you to picture for a moment, because I'm going to apply this in a minute to the church, and to me it's the most vivid, single presentation of what's happening in the church that is available to us today. Imagine now, after 18 centuries, the differences amongst those Jewish people. The German Jews, speaking German, not Hebrew, cultivated, educated, scientific, musical. The American Jews, and perhaps I better not say too much about them because you know them better than I do, but sharp, Good business, used to comfortable living, big cars, fur coats, elegant apartments. You come and come down to Miami Beach in the month of January and February, and you know what I mean. A thousand dollars a day for a penthouse, no object. Money that simply has ceased to mean anything. Now, I know that not all Jews are like that, but not a few. Then you go over to India, the Indian Jews. So dark, you wouldn't imagine they were Jews. Dressed like Indians in long white robes, talking Indian languages, eating Indian food. Then you go to South America and you find the Jews in Brazil and Argentina speaking Portuguese and Spanish with manners and gestures that make them look like Latin. And then you go to Yemen and Arabia and you get the Yemenite Jews looking like Muslims, talking Arabic perfectly, able to infiltrate any Arab situation because no Arab can tell from the spoken language or even the appearance, whether it's a Jew or an Arab that they're dealing with. With no idea of modern culture, many of them never seen running water come out of a tap. With bellies swollen with all sorts of diseases through fly-infested food, frail, suffering, many of them from glaucoma, withered, and think of them all coming back to one land. What a mix-up. What a mix-up. No common language, no common customs, no common clothing, Think of what's involved, what every one of them had to give up, how much they had to be uprooted out of. Eighteen centuries, my friend, of that background and that culture, that scenery, that way of acting and speaking. Don't think it's a little thing to leave that behind and go back to a little land that's dangerous and unsettled and uncertain. Think of the adjustments that are involved. And now... Can you see exactly the same is true of the church? Exactly the same? Nineteen centuries ago, the church spoke one language, the language of the New Testament. They all believed in the same way. They practiced the same things. They had one spirit. They had one Lord. They had one faith. They had one baptism. And then they were scattered into denominations. Do you know that in Jerusalem before World War II, the British government had got 72 distinct Christian sects operating with missionary work in Jerusalem, and the city didn't have 100,000 population at that time. Can you ever imagine that the Jews have found it a little difficult to find out which Christian sect was absolutely right? Because the majority of them said clearly that all the others were absolutely wrong. And if you don't come to us, it won't happen to you. See. Don't go to that mission down the road. You can't trust them. No wonder they got a little confused and perplexed. And now, the Baptists are having to pull up and come out. The Episcopalians are having to pull up and come out. The Presbyterians are having to pull up and come out. The Catholics, think of all the differences. And think what every group has got to give up. And lots of them are not willing to do it.
Lots of Jews weren't willing to do it either. Six million in Europe never made it. They left it too late. And you know, to me, this is the most solemn thought. You cannot procrastinate with a divine call. You cannot say, God, today it doesn't suit me. There's too much to lose. The respect of my friends, my income, my social position. Just wait a little, God. Do you know that I believe it could happen to the Christians as it happened to the Jews? I believe the Christians could leave it too late. I don't know how, but I have a feeling that it's urgent. I feel that there's a tremendous urgency. God said in Jeremiah, the 16th chapter to Israel, he said, I will send for many fishers, and I will fish you. And then I will send for many hunters, and I will hunt you out of the holes of the rock, and out of the caves, and out of the dens, and out of the mountains. The fishers were the Zionists. Drawing with a bait, come back to your own land. You'll find peace. You'll start to build a new life. And they went all over Europe in the years between 1930 and 1939, and they warned the Jewish people, you can see what's coming. Now's the time. Come while you can. And then God sent the hunters. He said he would, and he did. And they hunted the Jewish people up, literally out of every hole, every cave, every rock, and every mountain. I want to tell you this afternoon, and I believe the Spirit of the Lord rests upon me as I say it. It's better to obey the fishers than wait for the hunters. It is not a little thing what is going on in the earth. It's not some program tailored to your miserable little denomination or your particular personal convenience. It's the last call of Almighty God. And I believe I would be failing God this afternoon if I gave you the impression that the charismatic movement is just a little way of padding the churches and keeping them going another five years. It is not so. I am not telling you to join a church or leave a church. That's not my business. The Holy Spirit can do that. But I'll tell you that there is one unvarying requirement to be a participant in what God is doing amongst his people in these last days. Only one, and it's very simple. And I close my message by telling you what it is. It is total, unreserved commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, where he effectively is Lord of every area of your life. And his will and his commandments are sovereign and supreme above any other influence or voice that could speak to you at any time. And I am convinced that only those that have thus acknowledged Jesus as Lord will be privileged to participate in this last great way. And I tell you, I want to be one of them. I want to be one of them. I want to be there. After preaching the full gospel for more than 20 years, friend, I don't want to be a castaway. I don't want to drop out. I don't want to be carried away in that undertow and never reappear. I've seen too many to whom it's happened already. Brother Lindsay knows full well, much better than I do. I'm not giving you theories. It's, this is actual facts. It's a solemn and serious thing to heed the voice of God. Today, if ye he will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation and as in the temptation. A whole generation cut off from the promised land for the one reason that they would not hear the voice of God. Today, if you will hear his voice, will you obey him? Would you obey him? Would you let him speak to you? Would you let him challenge you? The final issue in the church, friend, is not going to be do you speak with tongues. Let me tell you that. This is just introductory. This is just putting the ball in play. The final issue in the church is what is Jesus Christ in your life? Is he Lord? Is he head over all things to the church which is, which is his body? Is his will sovereign? Does he have full control of every member? That's the final issue. And the lines are already being drawn. And it's amazing what kind of people are being found on what side of the line, isn't it? Lots of my full gospel friends are lining up on the wrong side. That sounds bad, but it happens to be true. And lots of the Catholics I never imagined will be found in the right camp. You know that? That's what it is. I started and I conclude with the same thought. It's bride or harlot. That's the choice. Bride or harlot. And the dividing line is one thing, the relationship to the bridegroom. That's all. The bride has remained true in spite of all testing and opposition and misunderstanding and persecution to the bridegroom. The harlot has broken her vows and shifted her allegiance to another. Let's pray. I have always said to God for the last few years that I never want to preach religious lectures anymore but that I want to give people an opportunity to respond definitely and practically to the message that I feel God has given me. 
And this afternoon there can be only one question that I can place to you. Are you willing, at the call of God, to submit and commit your life to Jesus Christ without reservation? I'm not asking if you're a Christian, if you've experienced conversion of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you are or are not the member of any denomination, does not interest me this morning, this afternoon. I'm concerned with this thing. In view of what God is doing, the tremendous challenge, the tremendous opportunity, the thrilling things, and yet also the fearful dangers that confront us, do you desire deliberately to put yourself at the total disposition of Jesus Christ for the rest of your life? Now, you may make mistakes, you may make errors, you may have shortcomings, but your sincere heart's desire is to yield your life to Jesus Christ. If you desire to do that here, would you stand to your feet? wherever you are. I'm going to ask Brother Lindsay to come and stand with me as I pray. And I'm going to pray God's blessing, God's will in the lives of everyone that has stood here to their feet. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank thee now for these that have heard thy word, heard thy voice, accepted thy challenge. Lord, there may be problems, there may be uncertainties, but one thing they've decided on, they're going to be true to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe, Lord, that you in heaven are delighted with this decision. That is the fulfillment of your will, and I commend them to you now, Lord, believing that fetters will be broken, problems will be solved, doubts will be settled, and they'll be issued into a new and glorious phase of Christian living that can go on victoriously from now until you come. And Lord, in everything, we'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Now, would you lift your hands up and just praise, praise God for them? God. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and LHBC 
www.bibleschoolonline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.